Hello, I'm Jeff Renner at the Seattle Aquarium. Coming up next, learn how orcas, the most controversial display animal in history, transformed our view of the Puget Sound environment. That next on Sound Conversations. I'd like to begin by humbly acknowledging that we are on the homelands of the Coast Salish people who have stewarded these lands and waters for generations and continue to do so. We live in a city that's named after a great chief, Chief Self, who of course we refer to as Chief Seattle. Your presence tonight, we are very grateful for, underscores your desire to partner with the Coast Salish people in serving as stewards for these spectacular lands and waters recognizing, as Chief Self did, all things share the same breath, and this we know. The earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to the earth. All things are connected, like the blood which unites one family. Talk to any of the staff or volunteers here at the aquarium, and you'll hear stories that underscore the power of encounter. Of adults, and I think especially of children, who are inspired by their encounters with a world they frankly have never seen before, and of the life that makes that world home. I think that same power of encounter is evident in the story of our guest tonight, specifically the power of a childhood encounter with an orca, a killer whale, and how it brought him full circle from a boy visiting the then privately owned Seattle Marine Aquarium that predated this one, and not very far, just a little bit to the south, uh, and now to this, our sound conversation in this Seattle Aquarium. That circle carried him through experiences as a commercial fisherman, through college across the mountains at Whitman College, graduate school at Cornell to a PhD focused on U.S. history and environmental history, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. He now teaches at the University of Victoria. His second and most recent book, Orca, How We Came to Know and Love the Ocean's Greatest Predator, offers rich and compelling insights, not only into the story of this charismatic apex predator, but also insights into us. And sometimes those are some very difficult insights indeed. But he uses his skills as a historian to offer perspective and dimension. The characters in his story are rich and multidimensional. And he also uses substantial skills as a storyteller, which I appreciate given my background, to engage us. And that's exactly what's going to happen tonight. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jason Colby. Jason, I think it's interesting that given your research interests in U.S. history and then environmental history, you came to focus for your second book on the story of orcas and our relationship with them. Uh, how did you come to that focus? I'd say this is, a, this is a book I was born to write, but I had to be in the right place in my life to, to write it. And, and that's because uh, the, it's a very personal connection that I brought to this story. I, um, uh, grew up on Bainbridge Island, right across uh, uh, the water from us, and uh, grew up with a father, uh, uh, John Colby, who in the 1970s uh, participated in the live capture of orcas, both in BC waters and then later in, in Washington state waters. And um, as a little boy growing up here, also I should mention growing up uh, for a time in, in uh, the San Diego area, that's me, uh, and, and I, I should say that the imagery certainly of orcas suffused my childhood. Here's, here's my favorite image of this. Um, test, testing and out. You a, test drove that. I was, right? that was, I was the guinea pig. Well, your pig. mom test drove yes. that, I think. More yes, I, was, I felt like I was driving. Um, and and as, I, as I grew up, we moved back here to Puget Sound, and I grew up actually you know, often coming to this very aquarium. But I also grew up uh, with a, a dad and really a, a family that was haunted by this story. And, and uh, and became more haunted as, as, as orcas became a more treasured, a more iconic uh, a species in our, in our region. The story of killer whales in the Puget Sound area, the larger Salish Sea, has not been a positive one. Could you, just for a sense of foundation, bring us up to date on the current situation of them? 
Yeah, I mean, most, most of your audience members, or our, our audience members probably know this, but um, there, are, there are several different ecotypes of orcas that frequent our waters, uh, and the waters of the West Coast. Uh, some of them are doing quite well. The mammalating transient orcas are, are growing in numbers. Uh, the northern residents that, that range from Southeast Alaska to, to uh, Northern Vancouver Island are doing quite well, but those that we know and love here in our, in our Salish Sea, the southern resident orcas, are plummeting in numbers, especially in the last 20 years, down to, as far as we know today, 75, and, mm -hmm. and very much, it seems, on their way to extinction. Now, there are some real differences between the resident killer whales and those that are transients that move in here. What is the defining difference between those, Jason? I mean, the, the critical thing to understand about orcas is that they're specialists, and, and they're food specialists, and their choice of prey all over the world really shapes their culture, their social structures. And, and in the case of the southern residents, they are, spe they are specialists in the art of salmon catching, and particularly in, in the catching of Chinook salmon. And, and, that is arranged for them from, from the Chinook of the, of the Sacramento River in, in San Francisco Bay Area all the way uh, to about Campbell River in, in, in BC. And so, so the, a lot of the range is the Salish Sea, very different than, than the, the marine mammal eaters, say, of the, of the, the, the transients. They don't intermingle with them, and they don't eat other prey, as far as we know. And this division, in terms of their diet, uh, goes back not just centuries, but much longer than that, correct? It does. It's, 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 uh, DNA has shown us that, that for example, the, the transients and the, and the southern residents have been separate and not interbreeding for at least uh, 250,000 years and maybe, maybe longer. So they're, they're quite, you could say, xenophobic toward each other. How do our regional orcas fit into the larger picture worldwide then? Well, I think one of the ironies is that in terms of numbers, at least, and this doesn't have to do with toxins and plastics and such, but in terms of numbers, orcas around the world seem to be doing quite well. Um, and, and our southern residents are only, you know, perhaps a half a percent or one percent of the whole global population. Um, they are, you know, one of the most widely ranging mammals in, on Earth, and you could say that, you know, like the other apex predator on land, human beings, um, they range all around the world, specialize and make their living in lots of different ways. And because they're an apex predator, they have had an impact on other marine life that specifically changed their migratory patterns, correct? Absolutely. I mean, they've, I mean as, a, as the apex predator of the ocean for you know, perhaps six to ten million years, they have uh, shaped the habits. You could even say they shaped the bodies, like, mm -hmm. like predators do, of their prey. You know, it helps explain why, for example, Doll's porpoises have great speed, perhaps, to mm. avoid orcas. It's also perhaps why uh, gray whales rear their young in sheltered lagoons. Um, and you know, species like gray whales, species like sperm whales, actually have evasive maneuvers they've developed specifically in response to, to this predator. So that's an interesting issue in terms of how they relate and influence other species of marine life. What about their relationship with human beings? Uh, and has it varied in different parts of the world? It has. I mean, human beings have been a, a coastal species as well, and, and the more we have gone you know, to the beach and to rivers and river, uh, the mouths of rivers and ultimately onto the seas, we've encountered not just the, the animals that we have, have chased for food, but, but predators. Um, and, and, and so human cultures and economies, you could say, have intersected with orca cultures and economies all around the world. Sometimes that's been contentious and sometimes not. There are um, really extraordinary examples in places like uh, uh, Eastern Russia, um, where the uh, indigenous peoples, at least there are stories of the indigenous peoples cooperatively hunting for, for baleen whales with, with pods of orcas. Um, and there's very well documented evidence of that kind of relationship that, that whalers in a place called Twofold Bay in Eastern Australia developed over almost a century. Uh, with a local orca pod where they cooperatively whaled. And, and even the whalers, to, to the point of anchoring the, the, the harvested whale, leaving it for a day for the orcas to take the tongue, and then hauling it in for processing. And so a, really a, a cooperative relationship. That's fascinating. What about in this region, though? Uh, what was the relationship initially with the indigenous people, and then later on we'll get into 
uh, you know, since settlement. But right. what about here? I mean, he, here too, it depended on the economy, local economies and cultures. And so uh, the Coast Salish were mostly a, a river fishing people, a, mm -hmm. a, a salmon fishing people. And so their encounters with orcas were pretty limited, often to you know, coastal transportation, mouths of rivers, they would encounter them. But they definitely were seen as, you know, among the other animals, as, as other creatures with essentially a personhood and, mm -hmm. the, and the rights to be here and to hunt salmon. And, 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 and indigenous people were very aware of, of their habits of coming and hunting salmon at particular times. Um, there was no documented uh, or, or even really uh, you know, stories of cooperation in the way that we saw in other places, mm -hmm. but there was coexistence. Mm -hmm. And then we ended up moving beyond the indigenous people uh, to the arrival of settlers. Mm -hmm. How did that change? That really transforms everything, especially with the, when you see the commodification of certain animals for, mm -hmm. for you know, whether it's for meat or for, for fur. Uh, but also, especially in the late 19th century, the, arri the arriving or the development of, of commercial and industrial fishing. And I've got a couple of images here that I think sort of capture the scale of this that we often forget. When we think of commercial fishing, we often think of boats, gill nets, but, but, but the, the scale in this area, in the Salish Sea, this is a reminder of the, the area we're talking about, the Salish Sea watershed. Uh, was really s extraordinary. This is, this is a shot from, from early 20th century, about 1919. These industrial fish traps that used to extend into the, into the straits in particular, Arrow Strait and, and Rosario Strait. Um, and each of these were really interlocking corporate-owned traps that, that took out fish at an astonishing rate. And, mm. and so you see uh, this massive scale of fishing, and of course then also the development of agriculture logging that remakes the watersheds in which salmon were breeding. And ultimately, uh, the upshot of this is, is people in this area started to think about animals as either useful mm -hmm. or as pests and threats. And orcas fell into this. They were considered ultimately a bit of a vermin species, something that threatened human resources and potentially humans themselves. Especially when it threatens human resources, very often there's a tendency to demonize mm -hmm. Uh, whatever species, whether they're uh, orcas, wolves, we can think of many cases, bear, uh, to make it easier to justify taking them out, essentially. How did that happen with orcas? There's, there's, a, there's a fascinating analogy to wolves. We think about how many awful stories from Europe and, and through North America there are of wolves and how many expressions we have of wolves. And this was a creature in, in maritime spaces, especially Northwest, that was often referred to as the sea wolf. Mm -hmm. and not just for taking potentially valuable uh, uh, animals, but potentially threatening people. And this is probably my favorite image I, I, I found in all of my research here. Stag Magazine, really at the time, this is a, this is a late 1953 issue, um, was a, a men's adventure magazine. And, and it was very common to have fierce animals threatening men mm -hmm. on the cover. And so you had you know, wolves, tigers, bears, Sharks, and this gives you a sense of where orcas fit into that. Mm -hmm. This is the killer whale that, that might indeed not just kill seals, but kill men. Probably the most horrific case of violence that, that I found in, in the world was, was just six months after this magazine came out, uh, uh, NATO troops based in Iceland engaged in several strafing runs and expeditions against orcas in the North Atlantic and killed hundreds. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we don't see that kind of organized violence against them here, but you see, you know, in the 20th century, certainly the first half of the 20th century, local newspapers from Olympia to, uh, you know, to, to Vancouver are replete with examples of fishermen, locals, teenage boys going out shooting at orcas for fun, often killing them. And, and, and these stories were celebrated in, our, in local press precisely because this is a creature that was viewed as a vermin species, a mm -hmm. dangerous vermin species. But there was an organized response that, in the hindsight that we have now, uh, in terms of the way science was done, was not terribly acceptable given today's standards. It's important to understand that whale science, that marine mammal science, was shaped by this same idea. What's useful to us, what's not useful, mm -hmm. what's dangerous. So the, the only lab in North America that actually did research on marine mammals was here in Seattle, what's now the NOAA lab was called the Marine Mammal Biological Laboratory at the time. 
and its job was managing the, the still existing whaling industry, managing the US government harvest of fur seals. And they had a standing directive issued in 1960, and it went all the way through the decade to, for their researchers to, to kill and dissect orcas and, and examine their stomach contents in particular mm. to see if they were eating valuable species, especially fur seals. So this next image I have, um, which is hard to look at, uh, is actually of a, of a Seattle-based researcher who had been working with whales, and this is one of at least 10 orcas that are taken off the Pacific coast in the process of this research. And this is the kind of research that, 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 that dominated marine mammal research, the kill and dissect variety. And, and so scientists in this area, including in Seattle, this is, was their vi vision and interaction with, mm -hmm. with, with orcas. On my side of the border, it got even worse, potentially. Uh, the, the Department of Fisheries, in response to complaints from, from sports fishermen and commercial fishermen, actually went so far as to install a 50 caliber machine gun right north of Campbell River for the express purpose of eliminating orcas and protecting especially the sports fishing industry and tourism. And in the end, it wasn't fired, mm -hmm. um, partly because machine gun fire probably would have chased away tourists as well. But that's how far things were going by, by the early 1960s. And the, the both sides of the border, we had virtually eliminated seals and sea lions. In BC, the fisheries department had completely eliminated basking sharks as a pest, and they'd never come back. And it was very possible at that time that the same could happen to orcas. We're going to get further into these issues in just a minute, but I think it's worthwhile to uh, sort of move forward in time a little bit, Jason. And that is that we had this response of mounting machine guns, strafing by airplanes. What sparked the change in terms of the way we viewed orcas here in the Northwest? The, 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 the quick response to that is close encounters. Close encounters that taught us to think about them as individuals. Mm -hmm. And one of the ironies is that one of the real sparks here happened by accident. In 1964, the Vancouver Aquarium, they don't like to talk about this now, but the Vancouver Aquarium uh, was building a new foyer and they wanted new sculptures for their foyer. And they wanted a sculpture of a basking shark, a sculpture of, of, a, of a killer whale. And they went out and looked for, for specimens to kill to use as models. They went out and killed one of the last basking sharks, used it for a model, and then they went after an orca. In the summer of 1964, a couple of staffers were on Saturna Island, fired a harpoon just a split second after this photo was taken, striking the young orca on the left, right, behind, right at the base of the skull, actually. To the surprise of everyone, this animal lived. And the aquarium decided to, to lead it back to Vancouver Harbor. They were really surprised and puzzled by why it didn't attack its captors. I mean, this is a wounded predator. Why is it not going after them? In the spirit of the times, they concluded this must be female. That's why. Named, named, named the animal Moby Doll. Actually later turned out to be, be male. And, and this was a powerful moment. And, and you're about to see the only color footage that's in existence of Moby Doll when, when he was being held at Jericho Beach in, in, in Vancouver. This is after a, a, about six weeks in captivity and there's such, such an abundance of run, runoff fresh water from the Fraser River in English Bay that, that, that Moby Doll had developed a skin condition, which wasn't actually life-threatening, but, but this is what happens to orcas when they're in fresh water for too long. Um, you can already see the flopping dorsal fin. Uh, it's a very sad story, the story of Moby Doll. He only, only lives about two and a half months in captivity, but, and it is only, but he's, he's shown to the public for one day, and, and this encounter that scientists certainly have with him, to the point where some staffers start feeding Moby by hand, really starts this turn in the way that, that, that the public is perceiving orcas. And for the first time, really is seeing one of them as a named individual. By the way, this, um, this footage is shot by a Seattle resident, uh, Ted Griffin. Ted Griffin uh, was described by one of his friends, as a sci whale scientist, as the Tom Sawyer of Puget Sound. Uh, he was a local. Um, in, in 62, he founded a, a small aquarium on Pier 56, right close to the, to the ferry terminal, called the Seattle Marine Aquarium. This is not this aquarium. Uh, this is 15 years before this aquarium was founded. 
And he timed it uh, to coincide with the opening of the Seattle World's Fair. Even before he opened the, the aquarium, he had really become obsessed with orcas. He had had a couple of very close encounters. Uh, he's, he, he's, uh, the best way to describe him, he's been described many ways, but the best way I, I would describe him, and I know him quite well, is fundamentally as, as, as someone who wants to connect to animals, as, as a whale lover, at least in the context of his times. And he was obsessed with the idea of befriending an orca. He tried to figure out all kinds of ways to do this. Jumping in the water, they would just swim off trying to find ways to capture one, to bring into the aquarium. It, these are all frustrated. You know, he mm -hmm. fails. He fails. However, a couple of Canadian fishermen accidentally catch a, a large male orca in northern BC. And Griffin, realizing this is his chance, runs around the waterfront to all the local merchants, including Ivor Hagland, and says, I have a chance to buy a killer whale. I'm going to bring it back to the Seattle waterfront. Do you have any money? I need money. I need cash. And they literally opened their tills, threw them into his, his, his knapsack, and he flew a, a float plane north to fork over you know, $8,000 to these fishermen. And in return, he got a whale, named after the town near, near which he, he was captured, Namu. Hmm. Hiring indigenous whaler, uh, indigenous, excuse me, welders, he built this crazy floating pen, and under with ra radio coverage from Seattle and headline coverage in Seattle, Victoria, and in fact across the nation, Life Magazine, even Sports Illustrated, believe it or not, Namu, this this strange flotilla, spent a month going going hundreds of miles from Namu, BC, to Seattle, hmm. and created an amazing stir. Even before Namu arrived at the Seattle waterfront, the locals were going crazy. They had these songs they were writing about Namu. And when he arrived at Deception Pass, thousands wow. lined the bridge at Deception Pass. This turned into an eight-hour traffic jam. That looks like 520 today. I want, <laughs> you know, Namu, and, Namu and Griffin pass under the Deception Pass bridge. They arrive to a waterfront that's packed with the lieutenant governor, the acting mayor, and as you can see, thousands of people there to greet them. Griffin had promised when interviewed that he intended to swim with his new killer whale. And journalists assumed he was joking. Nobody had ever, to their knowledge, swum with a killer whale. Scientists at the Smithsonian warned that he would be killed instantly if he got into the pen. But a few weeks after Namu arrives, Griffin fulfills his promise, slips into the water with Namu, You've got journalists there watching, anxious onlookers, and researchers, assuming they're about to watch the death of this young aquarium owner. And instead, Namu inspects him carefully, ultimately lets him touch him, scratch him, and eventually even, once Namu is moved to a, a little holding area of a rich passage, even swim, even ride him, I should wow. say. And this... I know this is, people view this kind of thing through the, the understanding of the development of SeaWorld and captivity, but this for people in 1965, 66 is something new under the sun. Mm -hmm. This image just a few months earlier is unthinkable. And it makes a profound impact, not just on the people that go and see Griffin swimming with Namu, not just on the people that see Griffin and Namu performing the world's very first choreographed orca shows, but also through outlets like National Geographic. Uh, uh, and Griffin publishes an article called Making Friends with a Killer Whale that sh showed up again and again in the recollections of scientists that I interviewed for this book. They talked about this as, as a young, you know, as a 10-year-old, as a 15-year-old, reading that article was the aha moment for them about whales and about orcas. Namu performs on the Seattle waterfront for, for about a year, or he's in residence for a year, that Hollywood actually makes a, the, I should say the producer of Flipper makes a Hollywood movie. Namu, how would you like to make a really big friend? It's filmed in, in partly in Friday Harbor. But by the time that movie comes out, Namu has passed away. And he's passed away, it's later discovered, through toxins and bacteria that had, that had leached into his body from Elliott Bay. What parallels then, Jason, do we see between the situation, what killed Namu, and threats, and we're going to go into this in much greater detail, mm -hmm. but the situation today? 
well, to be blunt, uh, uh, Seattle at the time was still doing what my current city is doing today in 20, 2019, which is dumping raw, raw sewage into its water, and uh, as well as you know many other pollutants and toxins that were going into the water that people really weren't thinking about. You know that that this is a local ecosystem that has to support life and. And Namu died of a bacteria, Clostridium, that, that was actually from human waste. Uh, and it was a, I would say, an omen um, that this creature that we were just starting to realize was precious uh, might be threatened not just by our own violence or our own ill-considered actions, but some of the invisible dangers we'd placed in the waters. Now, despite the change in the views that were the result of Namu and the, uh, his display, the shows that uh, he participated in. Uh, despite that change in views, the orcas that lived here or passed through here ultimately didn't benefit. Why was that? Well, uh, Namu was too much of a success, mm -hmm. to put it bluntly. Uh, Namu's performances on the Seattle waterfront were a double-edged sword. On the one level, it, it really, on the one side, uh, it, it taught people to have a, a new affection and think about these animals as individuals. The flip side, the other side of the sword, was orcas were clearly the next big thing in the growing marine park and oceanarium industry and, and very quickly replaced bottlenose dolphins as the marquee attraction that you have to have. And in fact, it's even when Namu is alive that Griffin starts meeting this demand. He captures a young female that he initially wants as a mate to, for Namu but that young female is sold to the very new oceanarium in San Diego called SeaWorld. Mm -hmm. And SeaWorld actually wanted to name this first whale Namu, because Namu was so popular. Griffin says, nope, that's my copyright, and so they opt for She Namu, which becomes Shamu. Over the following years, this demand becomes insatiable. You know, the late 60s, Griffin's company, Namu Incorporated, starts catching more and more orcas here. Some, some also captors get in the business on the BC side. Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing, on the one hand, this rapidly growing affection, and on the other hand, this, what we now know as a really critical threat to this population. And nobody knew at the time there was so few. And in fact, there's an assumption that there's thousands. And then there's really a, a thunderous event that happens in, in the summer of 1970 when Griffin's company, Namu Incorporated, he and his partner, Don Goldsberry, uh, capture in, again, the summer, when there are lots of boaters out, virtually the entire population of southern residents, 80 to 90 animals. And this is in Penco off Woodby Island. It's important to note that they had no idea that they had just captured all the southern residents, mm -hmm. that this was a super pod gathering. Nobody knew there was such a thing we should call southern residents. Um, but it's a catastrophic event, potentially, for the, for the, for the whales. Griffin actually immediately orders half of them released before he's even thinking about selecting some of them for sale. But the whales are traumatized, and certainly the people on the beach and in the boats are also traumatized, to the point where uh, several activists under the cover of night actually try to release the orcas by cutting the nets. Um, and unfortunately, the, the tides shift, the nets collapse, causing the drowning of, of four young calves. Hmm. This event ultimately leads to the very first regulation of, of the treatment of marine mammals, really, and certainly of, of, of killer whales in our waters. The, the state government steps in and starts regulating, doesn't ban, mm -hmm. but starts regulating uh, the capture. And, and ultimately, the, um, the opposition builds to the point where it's clear that capture and captivity, which had helped spur a lot of this affection, is, is now making it politically, culturally, increasingly impossible for this kind of activity to go on. And there were some major uh, state uh, legislators, officials, that literally this was in their backyard. Absolutely. And that, depending upon your perspective, either didn't help or helped substantially in changing the dialogue. Absolutely, yeah. One of the things you see, though, is, is this growing concern in, in local waters has these broader connections, mm -hmm. these international connections. Um, and I'd like to, to point out a couple of these that are often forgotten. We think about this as a local story, but, but several of these orcas that were captured here went on to really have profound world historical importance, I would call it, um, on, on the events. And I want to point out one in particular. 
Scanna on the left here was, was captured right across from us in, in Yukon Harbor, the other side of the water. And Scanna is the most important and influential cetacean in world history, I would call her. And others have called her the whale that launched Greenpeace, or at least changed Greenpeace. Because of encounters she had with, with the young man you see on the right, uh, a, a young scientist named Paul Spong, who was at the Vancouver Aquarium, I should say Scanna was sold to the Vancouver Aquarium, Spong is hired at the Vancouver Aquarium to study her, um, but his interactions with her are, are, are transformative on him. Ultimately, a couple of interactions, he decides she is acting more the scientist than he the subject as she, as she yeah. is attempting to sort of figure out how he's going to respond when she does things like, you know, nibble on his feet. Is he going to be afraid? Ultimately, he turns against captivity, becomes a pioneer of... Um, of wild orca research, but also goes on to convince Greenpeace that it needs to think about whales. In terms of the ban on captures in Washington state, there was yet another turn, yet another twist, and that led to some, you've talked about Ted Griffin, yeah. but some confrontations between people that up to that point had been partners. Yes, yes. Uh, it, it was really the, the, the controversy over the Penn Cove capture that, that, that caused Griffin to split with his partner and to leave the business. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and in Griffin's case, uh, was convinced that his partner was not concerned with the animals' lives and, and, and retired. Uh, but the captures went on. And in fact, SeaWorld then acquired, bought the Seattle Marine Aquarium, Pier 56, as a capture platform for orcas, for not just its San Diego franchise, but it had started a new franchise in Ohio Mm -hmm. SeaWorld Ohio, which no longer exists, and was planning to start one to open up in Orlando. And it needed whales. Right. You're not, it's not a SeaWorld if it doesn't have orcas, and this is the only game in, in the world. This is the only place you can get them. And so it buys, it buys the Seattle Marine Aquarium, keeps on the staff there, and their job is to catch whales for SeaWorld. And they struggle. They have a miserable time mm -hmm. without Griffin. But ultimately, in 1976, March of 76, they make a capture. And it's a capture, I, if I made this up and tried to sell it as a novel, I, there's no way I could do it. It happens within sight of, of Olympia, actually the, sta the, the, the state house in Olympia, where legislators just a week before had been, had been debating the idea of making Puget Sound a whale sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And within sight, through their windows, SeaWorld launches this capture. And it's, you know, by all accounts, an upsetting, violent capture in the use of seal bombs. Capture, they capture initially uh, uh, eight, a couple of will, will escape, but luck would have it that one of the top aides of Governor Dan Evans was on the water with his wife and friends, and that's Ralph Monroe, the long-standing long uh, Secretary of State here. They try to intervene and stop SeaWorld's capture. Failing that, they rush back home, get the newspapers involved, and this ultimately leads Washington State, the, the government of Washington State, to sue the federal government to end captures in Washington State, to sue the federal government and to sue uh, uh, SeaWorld. And they win. Ultimately, the whales that were caught at Bud Inlet, right, mm -hmm. right off of Olympia, proved to be too big for SeaWorld to keep, and SeaWorld's going to end up withdrawing from captures here. But two of those whales, two of those orcas, are given to researchers at the University of Washington and, and those that are working in the new NOAA uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's just been created. And they're, placed, they're brought to a place called Kanaka Bay in, in, in San Juan Island. And here's a, here's a shot of them here. They're now, they're now known as, as T4, T13 and T14. They were transients, mammal eaters. We now know that this was actually a mother and a son. They're, they really? were seen for years and years afterwards. Um, and I should say that uh, this is another funny part of, I guess, personal intersection because the caretaker of these whales um, for both the University of Washington lab and, and SeaWorld was my dad. And, and, and he brought his little, almost two-year-old boy to visit him here. And so that's me waddling in to see the killer whales. <laughs> um, and another fascinating intersection is that this is the first moment that a really well-known and extraordinarily influential researcher enters the picture, and this is Ken Balcom. Ken Balcom comes to, to uh, visit these animals, um, to, and, and he is just starting a, a population study in Washington state waters to determine how many there are. But in 1977, there was a very different sort of interaction 
Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. In 1977, there's a really uh, a near tragedy that turns into an extraordinary story, and this is on my side of the border in, in, in BC. Um, in, in the summer of 77, a uh, uh, sport fisherman around Campbell River named Bill Davis was just out sports fishing in a little spot called Menzies Bay, and he comes upon this lone orca, very small, clearly you know, a calf acting very strangely, approaching the boat, clearly hungry. He comes back and visits this orca several times and eventually gets, it's a small female we later know, and gets, gets her to feed out of his hand, which is unthinkable for, mm -hmm. for wild orcas. And so he, he realizes she's in deep trouble, contacts uh, scientists and ultimately the, the Sealand Oceanarium in, in, in uh, Victoria. They go out and, and net this young whale, drive her on a truck, and deliver her actually to a saltwater pool at a ho local hotel in Victoria. And this is a shot of her there. She nearly died. It's, very, it's, it's, it's discovered when they get her in the pool that she's been shot. She had propeller wounds and, and, and net wounds, and it almost certainly had some kind of encounter with a fisherman. Mm -hmm. um, which is a little reminder of the kind of interactions that fishermen had often had. Her heart stops on several occasions. The, the, the veterinarian actually pronounces her dead, but, mm -hmm. but shoots her full of adrenaline, and she springs back to life. And she is dubbed by the local newspapers there, Miracle. And Miracle lives in this pool until early uh, 1978, and is then actually airlifted by helicopter to sea land uh, into a pool, where I understand you actually got a chance to meet her. I did have a chance to meet her. Uh, just to pick the story and move it a little bit forward, in 1978, uh, I was co-producing a special, uh, we believe the first local special, on documenting the marine life of the Puget Sound area and the larger Sailor Sea, as we now call it. And we wanted to dispel that image of orcas, as obviously was uh, believed by the fishermen there, uh, though certainly not all. Uh, as being bloodthirsty and hazardous to human life and well-being. And so we went off the west side of San Juan Island uh, near Limekiln Point. We shot, and I remember it was pouring that day, but we got some very good video of the orcas out in the wild. And I remember thinking to myself and talking with my photographer, a wonderful photographer by the name of Craig Johnston, that, you know, the way we could really dispel this misconception would be to get in the water with them. And it turned out, without going into a lot of detail, early in the morning on a sunny October day, I was walking into sea land of the Pacific to do just that, to dive with them. They said, in captivity, you probably could do this. So this was what greeted me. A little bit of video here. Now, my sense of bravado sort of <laughs> vanished. I thought, that's a lot bigger than what I believe. You know, you see them in the wild at a distance and they're largely submerged. They don't seem that big. That was really big. So uh, we were up there, we walked in, and we worked with one of the trainers to go in. They had given us permission to go in. And I said to them, I said, how do they react? How will Miracle react when I go in on scuba gear? And he looked at me, he said, I don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? <laughs> He said, nobody's ever scuba dived with them before. And I thought, oh, great. So I said to my photographer, Craig, who I mentioned, uh, Craig, since nobody's scuba dived with them before, maybe you need to be in the water and get the entry and that sort of thing. And he looked at me and he sort of cocked his head and he said, uh-uh. He said, if, you're, if we're going to be the first people to get in the water, we need to get film of the first person getting in the water, which meant <laughs> I had to go in. So this is the beginning of that first encounter. Go in and see, uh, see, get used to it. If you open close and play with your uh, tank and your weight belt. And if she gets up, just push her away. Just push the whale push, away. Yes, tell her. Back off a little. <laughs> I was already getting nervous, but then look at this next sequence. I'm standing on the edge of the pool, and she starts mouthing my fin. <laughs> And I've got to tell you, I wasn't even in the water and my breathing rate increased and you could almost see, I didn't really, but you could see the pressure gauge starting to drop very rapidly. And so in this next image, it's just the sense of what was going through her mind, what would happen when I got into the water. Let's show you that. 
You see a orca, an adolescent but still large, open their mouth with its teeth, and she grabbed my weight belt and shook me like a human yo-yo. And then she came back, and she started headbutting me. And I'll tell you, you think getting, you know, colliding with a Seahawks linebacker is bad. This orca weighed seven times that weight, and I wasn't having much fun. And I was tempted to do right then and there what I ended up doing, and that is getting out of the water. But I put into practice what the trainer had suggested and push. Now you push a 2,000 pound orca, you know, you don't have to know a lot of physics to know that the orca isn't gonna go anywhere. You're gonna go spinning tush over tea kettle, as I like to say. But then after a couple of times of pushing, she got what she wanted and she came back and swam parallel to me and eyed me and I realized she wanted me to follow her around the tank. It's like you invite somebody to your home and it's, well, let us show you our place. And that's what she wanted to do. So then I got out of the water, and you saw the one image of my leaning over, but our photographer wasn't out yet. And I was sitting with my legs over the side of the pool, and she came up, and she laid her head on my knee. Now, this is an adolescent, and, but you figure, I would guess, the head is still a couple hundred pounds and could have easily, you know, done some serious damage. There was barely any pressure at all. And the obvious uh, conclusion was that she was consciously being gentle. And then there was, you can't call it a stare or a look. There was a gaze that sort of passed from miracle to me and then back again that gave me the sense of connection and totally transformed my sense of who orcas were. And I've got to believe, you know, with that special, it did the same thing. And we see that same transformation I think, among other people. But let's move forward now. Uh, we've been through the 60s and 70s. Let's go into the last three decades. How have we seen the human-orca relationships change? It's, it's changed profoundly, and a lot of people probably think about uh, you know, the, the whale-watching industry that's emerged uh, since the, really the 80s and really grew a lot in the 90s. But, but I, I want to I talk about how the, the relationship between scientists in particular okay. and, uh, was reframed. And we have to step back just a tick mm -hmm. to, to connect it to what we were just talking about. Sure. Previously, as I, as I discussed, you know, whale science was basically of the kill and dissect variety. And that's just how most naturalists, most, most biologists function. There wasn't a lot of wild, live research. So live captivity, as hard as it is to imagine now, at the time was transformative. This is the first time that people confirmed that orcas use echolocation. That was just a theory. This is the first time they understood how their diving physiology worked. Mm -hmm. And it was also the first time that they started to figure out how to possibly recognize them and track them. And the critical figure in this was a Canadian scientist named Michael Bake, who is really the patron saint of, of orca research, of orca science. And these are going to, be, going to be hard photos to see initially, but I want to make a point with them. This is Mike Big actually working with a captive whale at Haida. The very first whale you saw in Jeff's, in Jeff's uh, clips there was Haida. It wasn't, wasn't a miracle. And this is Haida. Right. And Michael Big here is using Haida as a model to fit uh, one of the very first radio transmitters ever attempted to, to place on, on, on an orca. And he's going to ultimately use that same transmitter to fit on a, a whale that was you know, tagged this way and also marked on his dorsal fin and released. This is a whale named Taku, who actually lived from this capture for 30 years after this. And the point I'll make here is that Michael Big, to a great extent in connection to some of these captive facilities, started to think about orca bodies in a totally revolutionary way, and in a way that reframed not just the way scientists think about orcas and also the public thinks about them, but also whales more broadly. He made the argument, ultimately, that we can identify them by sight, that you could study the shape and the marks on their dorsal fins, you could study the distinctive markings on their saddle patches, which you can't really see very well there, but right behind the dorsal fins, and he argued that these were as distinctive as a person's face, if you knew how to read them. The reason this is important is because you do, there's the first population counts. Some you know, government officials and captors are still arguing that there's hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands. There's population studies that they need to do. And he's arguing, look, we can track individuals, mm -hmm. count them that way, figure out if they're the same ones coming into this area, figure out if their groupings are the same, whether these pods are permanent. Mm -hmm. 
And ultimately, even though there's, there's massive skepticism, there are arguments that many scientists made was the only way you could ever distinguish them is by catching them and marking them physically. And they had tried to do this. Actually, the Washington state government had, during captures, tried to brand uh, orca skin the way you might brand Mustangs, uh, even talked about using lasers. But it's ultimately Michael Big's system, this photo identification system, mm -hmm. that enabled people to, I would like to say, read their bodies on their own terms. And this is what unlocks all the secrets, that, that this is how the naming of the pods take place, J, K, and L. This is how the, 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 the realization that there's a much smaller number of coherent, you know, this population that visits our waters and that it is threatened. And it's ultimately what helps unlock the reality that orcas are one of the very few matrilineal animal cultures in the world, and certainly the southern residents are that. That all comes from this revelation. And that also countered some of the assertions being made by some of the organizations that wanted to promote continued captures who were making what turned out to be some pretty wild overestimations of how many orcas there were in this area. Absolutely. This is critical ultimately to the much stronger regulation and then ultimately the ending of, of capture in this area. And it, but it goes on to, to influence whale science around the world. This is the way that people study and identify orcas around the world. It also helps promote photo identification of other whale species around the world. You know, it's not captures that are the threat now. I mean, the captures stopped in our waters in the 1970s, and it's worth noting that the southern residents recovered to nearly 100 by the late 90s. And then in the last 20 years, they've crashed. And that isn't about SeaWorld, that isn't about captures, that's about us. That's ultimately about decisions we've made and decisions we haven't made. And, and there are lots of threats, and this has been in discussion of, of, on both sides of the border. Toxins, absolutely. PCBs in particular. Uh, ocean noise, and especially the, the you know, container noise, uh, uh, oil tanker noise, and recreational boat noise, and such. But at the heart of this is food. Animals can deal with a tremendous amount of stress, stresses, threats, injuries, sickness, poisons, if they have enough to eat. But they're starving now. And, and they're starving in a place that used to be just, uh, you would yield up astonishing abundance to them. And now everything they know is wrong. The places they go for food, it's not there. Well, you talked earlier about the size of uh, Chinook salmon. 120, 25 pounds, mm. I think you said. And I don't know about any of you, but if you see salmon out in the wild or catch them, they're nowhere near that size anymore. No, and I mean, it's, it's uh, in, in the process of really remaking the rivers, the land, mm -hmm. um, you know, through dams, through hatcheries, through fishing, um, we have totally remade the biology of Northwest salmon and the ecology of the Pacific Northwest, which used to be the greatest engine for producing salmon on Earth, natural engine, and now it isn't. There was a description in your book that troubled me. It was uh, stunningly accurate, but was very troubling, and it had to do with your characterization of the Salish Sea mm -hmm. as, I think, saltwater lake. You had a little an different... Urban salt, yeah, an salt, uh, urban saltwater lake, I think, yeah. yeah. Increasingly, la increasingly loud, poisonous, and empty. That sums up the nature of the problem. When these issues are raised in terms of the challenges to food, uh, the challenges of noise, the toxicity, et cetera, and the shrinkage of the population of the southern resident killer whales, you get some that are very motivated by that and very concerned, but there are some, including some scientists, who, from my frame of reference as a meteorologist, I have to say this is similar to the response of some to climate change, and that is, it's inevitable. It's too late to do anything. Just accept it. What's your perspective on that? This is part of a broader ecological trend and concern that we need to understand. This isn't just about these 75 animals. This is the apex predator in our ecosystem that sustains us, too. And it, they're dying in a place that where she, they were exquisitely evolved. To, to live off of this ecosystem. Mm -hmm. They're starving. That says something really profound about the state of the ecosystem. They're the canaries in the coal mine. And if they're dying, that should be a wake-up call to all of us beyond just their, the question of them. And, and what I'll say is sort of more broadly about the question of should we just let them die? Well, you know, 
there have been many times where human beings have made extraordinary interventions or act, taken extraordinary actions when things seemed hopeless. And I'll point to the California condor, for example, mm -hmm. that was absolutely predicted to, to be go, going extinct. What's the point? It's not worth the money. And, and because of really bold action, they, mm -hmm. they were saved and they've recovered. Nature can recover. Rivers can heal. Coastlines can heal. They just have to be given space and time to do that. We have to be willing to take the really brave and often painful decisions to make that happen. Our home institution, our host tonight, if you will, the Seattle Aquarium, has composed a list of conservation priorities. And with us is Dr. Aaron Meyer. Dr. Meyer, if you would just step up for a minute, because you have some information you'd like to share with the group. Yes, thank you, Jeff. So everyone here today, I know some of you have been here before and some of you are very close to the aquarium, but in the spirit of ocean optimism, just wanna share that our mission here at the Seattle Aquarium is inspiring conservation of our marine environment. And our three conservation priorities are climate resilience, sustainable seas, and clean waters. And taking that forward to what we're here to talk about today around the orcas is I wanna acknowledge that we're here today in a moment of hope. We've just completed state legislative session, which arguably, was the most productive session of at least over a decade on the environmental side, which included a package of five bills that are gonna help advance orca recovery for our state. And something that's really exciting for me to share with all of you, which some of you know, is that for the first time ever, the Seattle Aquarium has been actively involved in helping to pass that legislation. We testified in Olympia. So incredibly excited, I don't even know how to say it. Uh, and we testified in Olympia, we were part of the negotiations, and we also helped influence the text of that legislation. So it's been a really, really exciting time for us as we've been turning the page for us here at the aquarium and getting more directly involved. And each and every one of us in this room today can be a part of those solutions. And just because I lead the group that does the policy action work, if you want to take action today, there's actually a petition to, the, to Congress to help uh, encourage support for orca recovery here. And you can find me afterwards and sign the petition, or you can do it on your own on your phone and go to orcamonth.com. I have to ask you, Jason, do you think that these measures point not only to an appreciation of the economic, the scientific worth of orcas, but as a change does it represent a change in our overall viewpoint of orcas, their place in the ecosystem, and our place in the ecosystem, perhaps verging from science and economics to ethics? Yes. I'd, li I'd like to believe that, that even in this time of rampant consumerism, um, that we're taking steps toward rethinking the, the, the rights of other species mm -hmm. to belong. You know, and whether that is us considering the need to safeguard cultural diversity of animals as well as cultural diversity of people. I mean, and remember, this is a unique culture that's about to be extinguished in our waters if we don't act. And, and, um, and they have a right to existence and, and, and their share of the resources. Um, and, and perhaps that is, we can take inspiration from some of the indigenous heritage in this, in this region that saw orcas and other creatures as you know, having a right to belong, uh, a bit, a, a, having a co-equal right to belong. Mm -hmm. And to me, in a modern sense, that means approaching nature not just as something to commodify, whether through you know, processing or, or necessarily through tourism, uh, uh, but something to treasure and to approach with humility and, and respect and, and empathy, even. Um, and as a historian, I want to remind everyone, I've got this sort of last image, that, that, that these orcas that we've lived with are passing through history just like we are, and they're passing through history with us. And we've reframed and remade their history too. And it doesn't have to be a tragic story. It can be a hopeful story. I want to point out that this is the first known photograph of, of Granny, the, the J-Pod matriarch who, who you know, by some estimates may have lived to, to nearly 100 years old. Mm -hmm. And she's passed away since. And after leading her family for you know, the better portion of her life and watching them struggle increasingly for food in a place that was once abundant. And for me, that's a question that goes beyond dollars and cents. This is a question that goes beyond uh, even the question of you know, hard-minded conservation. Is it worth it? Can they recover? 
granny and her family, Jay Pod and the other Southern residents, have a place here, and we have to ask ourselves what we owe them. Do we have, beyond just the scientific questions of ecological balance, do we have something deeper? Do we have a moral debt to be repaid to them for what they've given us and for what we've taken from them? And I, and I think that's a question we need to ask and then be, be willing to take tough decisions if, if your answer is yes. I would applaud that. Do you have any particular groups, measures that you would recommend people look to, go to, support uh, to continue this process of hopefully turning around the decline of the Southern residents? I have two pet issues that, that I mean, I, I support everything that, that, that was just said and, and very much support the, the, the aquarium's vision of, of promoting what we might call an ocean ethic uh, toward, toward orcas and other marine life. I will say two, two things that you could do that come to mind for me. One of them is support your local newspaper. Mm -hmm. So I live in Victoria. Um, I pay for my subscription to the Seattle Times, even in my weak Canadian dollars, because Linda Mapes and her team are doing the best environmental journalism not, not, just, not, just, not just here in Washington, but I would argue in North America. We don't have anything like it in Canada. I, I'm thunderstruck by, the, by what, she's, what she's produced, what they've done, um, and I just can't tell you enough how important it is to keep real journalism alive, and especially environmental journalism. So that's first. <laughs> the second is this, and this is... One of my big challenges when I've spoken and writing this book is to get people to stop thinking in terms of the border. This is an animal that doesn't even know we have borders. And it's, it's tremendously important what's happened in the Washington State Legislature, but the sad reality is that, that in lots of Washington, you know, a lot of these rivers are killed off or, or near death uh, by, by the changes that have happened, especially in the damming. That doesn't mean we shouldn't push very hard to take down the snake, the snake, the lower snake dams. That would be a tremendous boon. So that's a huge thing you could do here. But I will say this: the last semi-healthy river that the southern resident orcas rely on is actually on my side of the border, and that's the Fraser River. Main stem has never been dammed. The fish runs have never really been uh, uh, weakened by hatchery production. It was, it has been in recent decades, the most reliable food source for them. And the Canadian government now owns and it can, intends to pursue the, the pipeline expansion in the Fraser River Delta, which will damage not just the Fraser River watershed, but threaten catastrophic oil spills like the Exxon Valdez scale. Um, so I would ask you as Americans to consider writing my prime minister and saying, I love Canada but I will not consider visiting Canada as a tourist until the Canadian government reverses itself on this. I hope to have you back. Absolutely. That's going to do it for this edition of Sound Conversations. If you'd like to learn more about this program or anything else happening at the Seattle Aquarium, log on to seattleaquarium.org. I'm Jeff Renner. See you underwater.